Got on my red boots. <laughs> and if you are a previous TEDx person, that has meaning for you. Um, if, if you aren't, then just know that I feel really strong in my red boots. Um, so I, I sit here, I'm, I'm trying not to shake, and I'm trying not to be nervous, and I'm trying to be present. So um, what I have done is I have written a letter to Congress. I have no clue whether anyone from Congress will ever hear or read this letter. But it is helping me sort of work my way through a lot of the angst I'm having currently about what's going on in our country. So I thought what I would do, basically, is just share it with you. So unfortunately, I don't know it by heart. It's, it's like fresh off my computer. Like as of yesterday, I still made a few edits. So I'm going to have to read it, which means that I can't look at you like I'd like to. But I'm going to be reading and looking and trying very hard to be here. So here it goes. Dear Congress, I've been wanting to write you for a while. I need to come clean with you. I haven't liked the way you seem to communicate with each other. There appears to be a lot of name-calling, bullying, and downright mean-spiritedness. If we can't respect each other within our own house, how can we possibly work together to find the solutions our country needs so desperately right now? But the truth is, I don't know you. I'm a busy woman. I work full time and the single mother to two teenagers. I, like so many Americans, don't have the time or resources to know you. And so I gather a lot of what I know f about you from the media. Interestingly, as the founder of a nonprofit that works with young girls, the distorted images and manipulative advertising strategies have devastating effects. So it's no wonder that my impressions of you are less than favorable. Ugly behavior sells. It's all we see in the media. We all love a good train wreck. More hits, more ads, more ads, more money. I honestly don't know what is truth anymore. One network on this side claims you said this, and the other network on the other side claims you said that. Add in the pundits, the political satirists, and the experts in our newspapers and on the internet, it has become virtually impossible to know, understand, really see, and hear each other. I'm so tired of it. I'm close to becoming apathetic, and this is not good for me, my children, any of us. The complaining, my complaining, God, it never stops. It isn't doing any good anyway, and the truth is, the complaining isn't really because I'm mad at you, it's because I feel so frustrated, so helpless, so unheard amongst all this yelling. Everything seems so broken and unfixable. We are all so separated, distant, and far apart. Where to start? How do we possibly begin to tackle such a complex and overwhelming issue? Like I said, we don't know each other. So if you will allow me, let me start by introducing myself. My name is Molly Barker. I am a single mother to two teenagers. I love them. I love them with all my heart. I used to compete in the sport of triathlon. I did the Ironman in Hawaii a few times. I don't compete anymore, but enjoy running. I have three dogs and petrified of heights, and I'm a really, really bad cook. My yard isn't very well maintained, and my house is very small, but it is warm and welcoming. I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. I was the fourth of four, nine years younger than the one before me. My mom was an alcoholic, and my dad was a politician. It was not until I was in fourth grade and my mother had her breakdown that I'm able to remember much of my childhood. That was May of 1970. I'm happy to say that my mom stopped drinking, and from that day forward, our relationship flourished. The laughter returned to our house. A year later, my parents enrolled me in a new school. This, coupled with the typ typical adolescent angst and the deeply rooted shame I had come to know, made me a prime candidate for going to extreme measures to fit in. 
I felt invisible, alone, and ill-equipped to handle the new environment. And so I stepped into the girl box, that space many girls go around adolescence, where my appearance became more important than who I was, where dumbing myself down and having a boyfriend took priority over most else, where vulnerability, fear, and the sharing of those were seen as weak, where no matter how hard I tried, I would never be sexy enough, woman enough, good enough. So in 1975, when I was in 10th grade, that first sip of liquor at a friend's house had a profound effect on me. The noise, the voice of self-doubt, the shame and loneliness, it all just went away. About the same time I began to drink, my mom started running. One morning when I was 14 and she was 52, she invited me to join her on one of her early morning runs. I ran one block with her, about a mile. We didn't say a word. Our steps in unison, our breath in and out, mantra-like, the crisp edge to approaching, approaching autumn filling our lungs. I had never experienced anything quite like it, the quiet, the fellowship, the connection, the acceptance, the power. The one mile block grew into two blocks and then three, and eventually we were running eight, nine, and 10 miles, usually first thing in the morning. And despite the chaos of my outer life, the ever-growing despair alcoholism would bring and the depression that went along with that, when I ran, I felt connected, loved, strong, powerful, and real. For 18 years, the battle was hard fought between the strong, empowered me I found on those early morning runs and the confused, lost woman struggling to be something she was not. The alcohol won. On July 6, 1993, I hit bottom. I was 32 years old. I wanted to die. I called my big sister, Emily. I need help. Emily, I need help. And Emily talked to me and she urged me to go to sleep. This too shall pass, Molly, she said. This too shall pass. The following evening, a thunderstorm was rumbling. The air was electric with it. I decided, despite the potentially dangerous weather, to go for a run. Coming down that last stretch of road toward the place where I was staying, the thunder rumbling, the lightning overhead, the earth's tender reach to my feet, and the gentle urging to run faster and faster, my breath in and out, like sound of ocean and wind of soul. Something real, raw, and indescribable was happening. I moved into what I can only describe as the space of nothingness, no thingness. I wasn't a woman, a runner, an alcoholic, a divorced person, a struggling person, a poor person, a word or a label. I was nothing, no thing, brilliant, beautiful, and free. Three years later, I started a program called Girls on the Run. The program helps girls take charge of their lives and define the future on their terms. It provides a safe space where girls and the people who love them see, sometimes for the very first time, that they can choose to create a life where there are no limits, no constraints, no labels, only opportunities to reveal their greatness. The program started with 13 girls in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1996 and has now impacted over 600,000 in 210 cities across North America. <laughs> the success of the program is the result of so many dedicated, passionate, and loving people. Thanks to their continuing efforts and intense level of commitment, Girls on the Run is a living, breathing organism now able to survive with very little day-to-day -day input by me. I'm in an age where a piece of me wants to slow down, relax, kick back, and settle in. But I gotta tell you, that something about all this unsettled frustration, anger, and near apathy regarding our current state of this great nation won't let me go. There is a new voice growing in volume, nudging, pushing, encouraging me to speak up, to address the anger, 
polarization and separation between us all in these United States. Hence, this letter. Where this new voice was first brought to my attention was at a speaking engagement. Bruce Fritch, who is here today and who is now my vision coach, approached me after my presentation. You are a leader, he said. We talked for only a few minutes. The space he created, though, was infinite. On the drive home, I could think of little else. Me? A leader? Hell no. <laughs> I'm not a leader. I'm a lover, a social worker, a runner, a mom. I am not a leader. I'm an educator, a curriculum specialist, an inspirer maybe, but not a leader. Leaders don't look like me. Leaders wear suits, have MBAs or law degrees, and understand and speak the language of leaders. They are not what I am. I speak the language. I speak the language of love, connection, children. I am scarred, imperfect, and still wounded in some ways, trying very hard to be and become the strength and power I see every day in my own children the children I serve, and the amazing men and women who believe in our work. Leader? Me? No way. Leaders are, well, whatever they are, I'm not capable of that. I am not good enough. And so, without the thunder, the lightning, and the immediate shift in perception, I've more slowly come to realize that I had done it again, gone into a box. But this time it was the leader box. I had, as anyone would, and so many of us do, been manipulated into a limited view of what leadership is, and I certainly wasn't cut out for it. I have a past. I have a story. I get scared sometimes. I am imperfect. I am also 52 years old. I have one dance in me left. One last chance to lay witness to the brilliance that rests in you and me, our children, this life, our world. I know what I know and can no longer pretend that I am not a leader because I am. I am a leader. So, dear Congress, here I stand giving voice to her, this leader, the one writing you, that if she, heck, if I, if I could invite you for coffee, I would look you in the eyes clear the hard and bitter table that separates us and invite you without ridicule or judgment to talk about the things that really matter, like being wounded, about not feeling good enough or brave enough or loved enough. Talk about the brokenness of our current leadership models, the intense competition, bullying and name calling and how this no longer serves us. We would share how we don't know each other anymore and instead label judge and hide behind the fear of losing, being seen as weak. We would talk about our kids, our health, and our marriages, or lack of them. We would talk about how as leaders we often feel trapped, afraid to say these things, afraid to be vulnerable, afraid to connect with each other, afraid to claim and live fully into our biggest and boldest selves because we may lose our office, position, ranking, or funding, be raked over the coals in the media, be bullied, shamed, or ridiculed for simply being ourselves. And as I write to you, the self-doubt begins. I am challenged by the old stories, the old guard, and the voice from the leader box. Won't fix anything, Molly, the old voice says with near disgust. How ridiculous to suggest that something as simple as heartful dialogue over coffee could change anything. And I understand. I understand because I've been there. How much easier has it been for me to blame others, to wait for something to happen, to suggest that what has torn us apart is our broken political system, the media, the fear of terrorism, political posturing, loss of our traditional and valued institutions, money, power, ideologues, pundits, the other party, the blame list is long. But this voice of the new leadership, the one you and I will share over coffee, knows that it is in the smallest of moments where the tearing begins, this human condition, our tug of war between love and fear, the young girl who decides in a split second to step away from her computer screen, 
to call and comfort the girl they are bullying. The young wife, who in an instant decides it is time, turns, cries, and says a prayer of hope and love for her abuser as she leaves him. The father, who in one small revelation decides to put aside his need to be right and calls his estranged son to tell him, I'm sorry, I'd like to listen. We know because we are human that it is in those precious and private moments when we can choose to complain, judge, blame, label, or choose to take action, dig deep, do what is right and what is good and what is love. Those moments are when the leader in all of us lives. Interestingly, it is at this point in this letter where numerous people I respect immensely made a variety of recommendations. Your ending is weak. Challenge them, Molly. Confront them. It's time to stop letting them off the hook. We need change and we need it now. Hit them where it counts. So I tried on that ending, for a little while anyway, when it hit me. That's the predictable ending, the one we all want, where I really give it to you, knock it out of the ballpark, tell you what I really mean, and ironically, the one that would make this speech go viral on the internet and in the media. But that's not changing anything. That's just doing more of what got us here. Besides, that's not me. That's not how this leader lives. The spirit which grew Girls on the Run from 13 girls to a movement influencing literally hundreds of thousands of people across North America, this spirit didn't force, confront, shame, or challenge people to move from a place of weakness to strength. No. This spirit was and still is an invitation for those who are willing and ready to reveal and unleash what is already there, the love compassion, strength, and brilliance that is within each of us. And so, my honorable friends in Congress, I invite you to join me in bravely breaking free of our culture's confining, defining, and limiting leader box and accept my invitation to, in the small, quiet spaces, over coffee, on a run, or like the one I am sharing with you right now, in that sliver of a second, when we can choose the words, the thoughts, and the actions, I invite you to consider choosing love, compassion, and the willingness to listen, to really see and honor each other and ourselves, to be what lies within, strong, brilliant, and wonderfully human. The coffee is on me. I'm ready to listen. Sincerely, Molly Wilmer Barker.